everybody. Let's stand this morning. Good morning. It's great to see everybody here today. And we just ask you if you would to honor the protocols that are in place. But here's the other part. Why don't you just drop the fear and anxiety for a short period of time and let's have church. Amen. Come on, lift your voices this morning as Pastor Malik leads us. Come on, can we clap our hands?
was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I If you're comfortable, can you lift your hand as a sign of surrender? Knowing that our Heavenly Father is for us. And if He is for us, who can be against us? We're going to sing the truth over our lives that we are chosen, that we are not forsaken. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against. forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you Come on, say church, I, am. That high, I am. Chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. Walking around 
these walls I thought by now they fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battles won For you have never failed me yet Come on, let's sing this out, your promise Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your this is my confidence, you've never failed me yet. And you never will, and you never will. We thank you, Lord. I know. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to You're still enough. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Oh, every voice we declare, your promise still stands. Your promise still stands.
I want you to just go after God for about 30 seconds on your own. Just begin to call out the name of Jesus. Find your seats today. It is so good to see everybody here today, and what a beautiful day, man! And uh, glad, glad you uh, took a chance on battling the heat to get here today. But no, it is really great to see everybody. If you're a first time attender or guest, we generally have a another way that we would welcome you today. But obviously, because of certain protocols, we can't do it the way we would like to. But so we're just going to tell you that we have a gift bag out for you. In the lobby area, you'll see it's very evident on one of the tables there, and uh, tells you a little bit about we, who we are, but it also just has a gift in there 
expressing our appreciation. If you visit a church in the middle of COVID, you are an amazing person. Amen? And I don't mind telling you, we'd love to have you. But anyway, welcome today for, at the bridge today. I'm going to ask the, uh, well, see, I'm in, I'm in this, you get in this routine. I was calling the ushers, and we're not calling the ushers. We've been doing the offering a little bit different, and uh, many of you have transitioned online, and some of you are sending it by snail mail, and, uh, but there will be ushers at the door as you leave today if you so desire to put your offering in that way. But we always read a scripture related to why we give, because how many know giving is just another form of worship? And so today we want to read from Joshua 1.8. Come on, everybody read with me. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. I want you to see something there. Prosperous and successful was not something the televangelist invented. It's only about a 4,000-year-old concept. Amen? Hey, Jesus, as we give, whether today or by some other means, we want everything that you have intended for our life to become a reality. And we're not afraid to ask you to not only meet our needs, we're asking you, Jesus, to bless us beyond what we need so that we can help others and God so that we can facilitate your activity in other dimensions of our area and around the world. So we ask for you to help us, God, be able to participate more in the kingdom of God through giving in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 The Lord bless you as you give at whatever point you give. But at this time, turn your attention to the screen for today's announcements. We hope you're having a wonderful weekend so far. We're extremely grateful that you have chosen to join us here today. Here's what's happening at the bridge. Parents, it is now time to start registering your kids for Mega Sports Camp coming up Sunday, August 2nd through Tuesday, August 4th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Mega Sports Camp is a Bridge Kids sports-themed vacation Bible school program for all rising first through sixth graders. Kids can choose between soccer, football, and cheerleading. To register, simply head over to our events calendar at bridgeforlife.com. Our Community Connection Serving Group has partnered with Fauquier Fish to provide children right here in Fauquier County with a new backpack and school supplies for this upcoming school year. This year, simply pick a grade and a gender of student that you would like to sponsor. To find a generic list of supplies, pick up a flyer at the Welcome Center or head over to the Fauquier Fish website. The Bridge will be hosting a community-wide homeschool forum on Sunday, July 19th from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. in the White Box. This is for new families that have found themselves thrust into homeschooling for the upcoming school year. There will be a panel of individuals that are experienced in homeschooling and other leaders in the community that offer resources for homeschoolers. Also, there will be a time for questions and answers to help guide you through the process. To accommodate for seating, please register online under the events calendar at bridgeforlife.com. Thanks and have a great week. Mark your calendars. On Saturday, July 25th from 5 to 8.30 p.m., we will be hosting a young adults volleyball tournament here at the bridge with the help of Lords and Baptist Church. We are inviting young adults from other churches in the area to come out for a cookout, volleyball tournament, and a night of worship. This is an opportunity for us to get connected with other believers in the area and worship the Lord together. You're welcome to invite your friends as well. If you are interested and are not a part of the Young Adults Ministry at the Bridge, please get in touch with me. Additionally, we meet Sundays at my house at 5 p.m. for Young Adults. Please contact me or just show up if you're interested. Thank you so much for watching. In case you missed anything, you can check us out online or even follow us on social media. We hope you have a great week ahead and look forward to seeing you all again next weekend. everybody here today. I know we've got a lot of folks who are back for the first time since the COVID thing started. We want to say welcome to you today. We're glad that you're here. And uh, you probably can look around and see that we're right on the border of, well, in fact, we did. We had to shut down this service last night for registration. That's, that's a good problem, people. I was just let you know that. 
So I'm just going to ask a favor. Uh, if you would be available during this season of the COVID, if you could do a Saturday night at least once a month, everybody say once a month. If you would have the ability to move into a Saturday night once a month, that would really help because we anticipate that this is the service that is going to continue to have the bulk of people making it their first effort to be back in church service. Amen? So if you have the ability just to say, hey, I can do that one, one weekend a month instead of coming on a Sunday, I'll do a Saturday night. I'm just telling you that we've just done a little survey how that really frees up a lot of things and spaces here. So if do not hear that pastor said skip a weekend. What you heard pastor say was if you could take one Saturday a month as opposed to coming on a Sunday, it would really help. The other thing is this, I really appreciate all the expressions, cards, notes, social media contacts. Uh, many of you know my dad passed away about a week and a half ago, and so last Sunday my wife and I were actually en route to uh, head to my, uh, uh, my, my mom's house and all the extended family coming in and that. And so uh, I want to say to Pastor Ben, he's here this morning, thank you, brother, for filling in and helping me. I gave him real short notice. He had three days. And uh, I appreciate him stepping in and doing that, and he did a good job. Amen? So thank you, Pastor Ben. I appreciate that. But uh, my dad now has been running around the streets of heaven now for about uh, 10 days, and uh some of you know he's had a prolonged battle in a nursing home, and I can say that with confidence. I know he's running around, because when you've been in bed, when you've been bedridden for two years, how many know you're ready to sprint? And uh, so anyway, appreciate that. So today we're starting a new series, 2 Thessalonians. I just concluded 1 Thessalonians. We're going into 2, and it's actually called Enduring in Hope and Freedom. And there's a reason I gave it this title, not only because of the context of the book, uh, 2 Thessalonians, but we are now at that point where endurance is pretty critical for us, amen? We are four months into this COVID. Most of us probably didn't think it was going to last this long, and I'm not trying to be discouraging, but if you just kind of look, after four months, we are now back where we started. The restrictions are still on and everything is still up. The only thing that's changed is our amount of debt. And so, and now they're telling us they can't tell us when this is going to end. You know, everybody's making plans for the fall and trying to sort out whether it be school. And that's why we're having this forum today because there's a lot of people having to make adjustments and make critical decisions. And our point here at the church is we're just trying to provide you information. We're not trying to tell you how to, how to, what your ultimate decision is. That's your call. But we want to provide as much information and help to you as we can possibly be so that you can make the best decision for your family. So I just want you to know that. But this thing, there's no end in sight. By the way, I pray every day for whoever's working in the lab to come up with the cure. You know, I figure God knows when and where this is going to happen, so I'm constantly praying, God, I don't know who's working on the cure, I don't know who's working on the vaccine, but I bless them today. And uh, yes, Lord, uh, I know you've got your people in place, so I don't know who I'm praying for, but I'm assuming when it's announced, we'll get the name of the doctor and I can say thank you, Jesus, for that person, amen? So let's everybody stand today as we begin in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 and 4. 1 through 5, everybody read this with me. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. Now, Lord, as we look at this today, we ask for the word to just do more than inform us. We ask that it transform us. 
And I pray that you would give us wisdom and insight on decisions, God, that many in this room will be making not only in this coming week, but God, in the, in the coming weeks and even a few months. God, you know how to prepare us so that we know what we need to know at that moment. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 You can be seated today. So as we're looking at this enduring and hope and freedom, you find that that's what people are struggling with, uh, putting effort into. We're trying to maintain our hope. <laughs> and the other side of that too is how many know we're also concerned about our freedom? And that's not a political statement. But how many know we want to get back to what we're used to? You know, I, I, I want to be able to go do the activities and things. So our freedoms have been restricted and restrained for many of the right reasons. And so you, st- you just say, man, how do I manage and how do I do this hope and freedom in my life at this time? And I just want to say this, our faith and obedience is tested when the challenges of life persist without a solution in sight. It's one thing to believe God that I'm going to have an answer tomorrow. It's another thing when you recognize the answer is not even in sight. So how does my faith help me? How does my faith guide me, inform me? How do I express that? And some of you have been through these experiences. If you've had any kind of long-term illness, you know what I'm talking about. You believe God for healing, but this illness is being prolonged and it's playing out for so long and there's no cure or there's no resolution on the disease that you may be battling or trying to go through rehab and it can be frustrating. And the, on the other side of that, some of you have had family issues that persisted for a very lengthy time and you just like, God, just give me resolution or grant some answers. So it's when it gets into that prolonged season that life gets really challenging. Because then it begins to affect our attitude. Early on, we're believing God for a particular outcome. But the more a situation plays out and it is prolonged, suddenly it begins to affect our attitude. And then we find this, maintaining hope and momentum and motivation and vision, purpose and faith becomes a battle in itself. Forget the outcome, I'm just trying to stay sane. You hear me? It's... Forget, forget, the, forget everything being resolved. I'm just trying to get up. I, I hear people say, man, I'm just trying to get up in the morning and figure out what can I do today? Who can I talk to? Who can I be around? Where can I go? Those are the biggest decisions I have every day because my routine has been disrupted and they're still not giving me an indication of when it might return. I'm still trying to figure out all the things associated with my job. I have to do certain things, and I'm just I'm trying to navigate all those things. So there's a lot of frustrations. This past week, at, when I was, we were having our, my uh, dad's funeral, uh, a couple of uh, our, our denominational leaders were there, some of the superintendents, and those that I'm close with and have a good relationship, we were in conversation. And I'm just going to say this as an average. Some had a little higher, some a low, a little lower. But they even, I said, how are things going where you're at? And, and, and the average number was this. They said, I got 30% of my pastors in depression. Not, not, not temporarily. They said, I'm concerned that when this is over, I don't know if they're going to come out of that. This is not a temporary thing that they're battling, that when it turns around, they'll be okay. They said, oh, my fear is it's going to turn around and it's not going to affect them. That it's become a way of life. And we're just trying to figure out how do we get them out of this hole? How do we pull them out? How do we help them? How do we encourage them? And I said, I, I hear you, man. I said, my wife and I have had this discussion. When you, when you love people and then they tell you the people that you love are your greatest threat, man, you're just caught in this quagmire of, but I like them. Well, I know, but you can't show them. Well, I want to hug them. Don't you dare hug them. Well, I want to... I want to talk to them. Well, you stay six feet away. Well, I don't want to talk that loud. I don't want my conversation to be heard in the room by everybody. If I wanted that, I'd grab a speaker. I just want to talk to them. I just want to find out what's going on. It can be very, I'm just telling you, it's a a battle. It's a frustration. And so you find yourself going, I'm not worried about my schedule. I'm just trying to keep my attitude going. And especially, like I said, with no end in sight. So, I, let me just say it. I think our faith works more now than it ever has before. I don't think our faith is silent about this. 
I think our faith informs us. It's just that because of the context that we've been accustomed to, we've missed some of the things that God's Word has said. I was talking to somebody earlier and I said, let's not, let's not forget, the Christians were outlawed as a faith until 350 A.D. And by 350 A.D., half the Roman Empire had converted to Christianity. All under the guise of being illegal. And the new emperor said, why are we outlawing these people? Half my kingdom, half my empire is Christian. Let them eat. How many know that was a brilliant decision? I'm here to tell you, if, if, our faith, if the faith worked 2,000 years ago like that, I think it can work now. It's no different. So, what's happening in Thessalonica that Paul wrote the second book? We already talked about the first. Why did he write the second? Because he wrote the first book, answered their big questions. They were under tremendous persecution, and they were new converts, and they're just trying to figure out How does my faith work in such a difficult context? So Paul writes this magnificent 1 Thessalonians, here you go, and you know it would be like any place else. The man of God has spoken, let's take the word and run with it. God is for us, he's going to answer, things are going to get better. And the opposite happened. They got a word from God and it got worse. Now that will depress you. Because everybody wants the word of God to be the changing point. Because I got a word from God here, now I can expect a whole lot of good things to start happening. And we find they got a word from God and things got worse. So, new people in Christ, they have more. How many know that raises a lot more questions? I thought this God of yours was supposed to make things better. I thought God was supposed to be able to move the mountains. And I thought God was supposed to change things. And, you know, so new new converts, okay, listen to me. They don't have the history. See, how many, how many have a history of God moving mountains in your life? Let me see your hand. So what I want you to recognize is that new converts don't have that. They're still looking for their first mountain. So when that challenge comes, they don't have a history of going, well, I just know that God will move. I just know God's going to come through. They're just like, now tell me your story again because this isn't going anywhere. And, and how, did, how, how, how did you know God was going to come through for you? Because, see, I'm new in the Lord. This is my first mountain. How will I know when it's going to be moved? How, how, how will I know how God wants to do it? And then, as you look on, in spite of all of his teaching in 1 Thessalonians, the followers of Christ in Thessalonica continue to be confused about a few things in regard to their faith. Because... They believed what God could do, but if if God could do those things, why was it worse? Well, I'm here to tell you, I think we're in that same boat right now. I would probably say this has gone way longer than anybody thought. And we still don't know when the end is in sight. There's a lot of tension in the culture about certain decisions from schools to sports to all sorts of things. Nobody knows where this thing is really headed. And so here's our faith, and I'll be honest with you, I've I've told the Lord, look, you don't have to tell me everything, can you just let me know enough that I'm headed the right way? You don't have to tell me everything, I just need to know that I'm doing all that you expect me to do, just give me enough that I can be confident or I can make a course correction. Because man, I wake up every day going, God, is there anything else I can do at this point in time, in this junction? Is there any, I, I don't want to miss something. I don't want to, I don't, this is my, this is my name. God, I don't want to, I don't want to get lazy. Listen, I have watched all the movies that I wanted to watch. I even watched them a second time just to confirm that the outcome, and let me just tell you, when you watch it the second time, it is the same outcome. And so now I'm just like, I don't even want to, I don't even want to watch it. I mean, I've, I've had enough. I just, I, I, I just want to get back to life with one another. Amen? So let's begin to go through this. Everybody read point one with me. An enduring church facilitates genuine conversions. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to read that first verse, and you're going to go, 
do not even remotely see in that verse what you just said. But how many have got confidence your pastor can get it there? One amen and a few hands. <laughs> Love it. Love the confidence exuding in the room towards the speaker today. All right. So here's the thing. I'm going to read something here. The challenge is this. You and I are separated by 2,000 years of when this was written, and the cultural understanding was significantly different then than it is today. And I'm just saying, even how we process things, they, would, they, they had a different mindset. They had been uh, educated differently on how to, how to look and hear and see things. So now we're 2,000 years later, we're in a completely different culture, and we have a way that we learn in America, right? So here it is. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In American culture, we would have thought it would have said the church of the Thessalonians of God, of God our Father. It doesn't say of, it says what? In, that's the key word. No religious uh, organization or uh, cult, pagan religion, whatever, would ever say in. Wouldn't say it. Wouldn't teach it. Even in their day, Rome was known for its paganism of many, many, many gods. And it, they would never say in their God. They would say of. Christianity comes along and uses the word in. That would have been a huge element that would have leaped off the page going, wow, in? See, they, their pagan religions were a part of their culture. It was just a part. So they, they would have had a natural inclination, even, even if they weren't maybe participating in that particular pagan religion, because it was a part of Roman culture, they would have at least understood its basics. And that phrase would have jumped off. You say, what, what, what do you mean? Well, the apostles developed this in their teachings. And it's important to understand what it means by it. So we're going to jump to Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. I'm going to read this, just follow along. And I want you to notice something, how they kept using this word in. He says, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the in the divine nature. Do you, do you see that? He said participate in the divine nature. He didn't say observe. He didn't say learn from. He didn't say watch. It actually says participate in the divine nature. Now let me just get this. This is not, this doesn't make us all little gods. Okay. Don't, don't go there. Don't, don't, don't go off that deep end. That's a whole nother, that's a trap. That's not worth this, what they're applying at all. What they're saying is this. Christianity is not an observing faith. You don't come and observe. You don't watch Christianity. Christianity is where you come and you actually experience God. He dwells in you. You feel God because you're participating in his divine nature. God does not say, come, kneel, stay prostrate, and observe my greatness. God says, come, kneel, stand up, sit on my lap. Let me lift you up. I want you, God says, I want you to participate in who I am. Let me ask this question. How many of you have ever found yourself in a tough spot and all you could get out of your mouth was Jesus help me? I just want to know, I want to make sure I'm not the only one who's ever had to pray that one before. Yeah, you just go, Jesus help. And a presence came. Maybe not the answer, but you felt him. Folks, 
That's participating in the divine nature. That God says, I don't want you, I don't want, I don't want a gap between you and me. I want you to not only see me, I want you to experience me, I want you to feel me. Come. Participate. This is a, a, another scripture, Galatians 2.20. Paul wrote this. When we use the scripture, our emphasis is on one part of the scripture. He actually develops more of what I just said, but because of how we've been taught and we're trained, we emphasize the first part of the verse and we miss what's later. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith. What does it say? In the... Does it, now here, you know what it should... We would have thought it would have said by. I live by faith by the Son of God. How many know that almost makes sense too, right? But how many know there's a difference between by and in? And he says, in, who loved me and gave himself for me. He is just saying, man, this is, this is you experiencing Jesus. And I just say that, that's genuine conversion. When we talk about people accepting Christ, we're not talking about bringing a God into your life that you can sit there and on occasion observe. We're talking about inviting a God into your life that you can experience. And that he just, listen to me, he doesn't want to live beside you. He wants to live inside you. Huge difference. Totally and radical shift mentality Christianity and the other pagan religions of the world because they would say come observe our God Christians could say come experience our God and have him in you radical mindset and I say that an enduring church listen of all the times you need to cultivate his presence in your life it's right now and you may only be able to get out the words Jesus help me because I didn't see what today had for me. I couldn't pray for this this morning. Because I didn't see it coming. And the only thing you can get out of your mouth is, help me. I just want you to know the divine nature is there. And he's inside of you. Amen? All right, number two. Everybody read it out loud. An enduring church increases in, it increases in faith. He goes on to say, we ought always to thank God for you because, or for you brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith, listen, is growing more and more. So he uses the word ought, which means a deep obligation and responsibility. He uses then the phrase later, growing more and more, which means to grow beyond expectations. So hear me, our faith is not something that sits idle. Our faith is something that is in motion and it is growing. And this is a season that really makes that difficult. But I want to challenge you, don't leave your faith idle in the middle of all this. Let me, let me tell you something. I actually think this is the finest hour for the church. You say, how can you say that? Well, I'll tell you how. Let me, let me, let me encourage you to grow your faith on a daily basis and I can tell you how you can do that. One of the ways that you can cultivate and facilitate your faith is this. I have yet to have anybody decline what I'm about to say. And I'm ta I, I mean even people who aren't followers of Christ. But if I have a friendship and I have some kind of relationship, I will say this to them. I'll say, how are you holding up, you, your family, or whatever their, whatever their context is? I just say, how are you holding up? How's the family doing? How's your work? How's everything going? And let me tell you, people will tell you. You don't have to drag it out of them now. They're more than willing to tell you what's going on. And then I say the second thing. How can I pray for you? Yeah, I say it on the street to the guy who's not even a follower of Christ. And you know what? I haven't had anybody decline. Nobody. Nobody has declined me. You go, well, that's because you're a preacher. No, I'm here to tell you. They're ready to tell a preacher no more than anybody. I actually have the deck stacked against me on that one. 
They, they generally go, oh, no, I'm, I'm good, because I'm, they always think this is some kind of, uh, I'm trying to convert them to the bridge. So they go, oh, I appreciate that, but I'm good, you know, because that, that's their offering. I haven't anybody declined me. They'll go, man, I haven't had anybody ask me that. I really appreciate you asking. I said, well, I mean it. How do I do that? There is never a hesitation. There's never, well, give me a minute to think. As soon as, as, soon as we get through, they go, you can pray, and I mean, out of their mouth comes stuff so fast. They don't even have to process. They're, like I said, some of them aren't even followers of Christ. And they're ready to tell you how to pray for them. And I do it right there. Now, I'm not having an evangelistic rally when I pray for them. You're like, oh, God! You know, I'm, I don't do that to them. You know, I just say, hey, man, I'm going to pray right now. And I... I keep that conversation as confidential as they would expect it to be. I don't broadcast what I'm doing. I just, I just have a, a quiet, respectable, and honorable prayer. I want to encourage you, be the church. I think this is the finest hour where we can say, I know it's hard. I feel, I, we struggle. We're, we're having the same issues but God's helping me, and I think he'll help you too. And Everybody said amen. amen. Here's another point about enduring. Tough times will expose and, and, dis, and dis, destroy faith that is false. You read the parable of the sower where it says that seed fell on good ground and some fell in rocky soil and some fell on a path, and it talks about how those other options other than the healthy soil when tough times came their faith dried up and this is a great time for us to discover how committed and my effort and my heart listen it's the the most difficult thing is is when you know God can do something and you can't understand why he's not fixing it right now you can't understand it this past week when we were all together, it's kind of ironic that maybe you observe this in your family. Because of distance and travel, there's not a lot of family reunions anymore. And suddenly you find the funerals have become the family reunion. And so that was our case, you know, because we're all spread out over the U.S. We were all there, all the grandkids, all our kids, my sister and her side. And so, you know, on one hand we were, we were honoring our dad and burying our dad. But on the other side, then we were going back home and we we're having a family reunion. It was kind of a... A weird emotional roller coaster time. And so while we're outside, one time with all the grandkids, my granddaughter Mackenzie, she hit her knee and it was enough to produce a little tear. And so she runs over to Papa G, you know, Papa G hit my knee, it hurts. I said, Come here, baby, I'll hold you. And, you know, and I held her. And let me tell you what I didn't do. Now, Mackenzie, let me tell you what exactly happened here. See, when you hit your knee, there was this neurological surge that went through the neuro neurological system of your body and it went up your leg. And when those neurological uh, surges hit your brain, it triggered some things up there and your brain says, ouch, that hurt. And so then the impulses went back down and you began this neurological exchange of the pain and how bad it was and there might have even been a little swelling, you know, but hey baby, let me just tell you, those neurological surges will stop in about three minutes. And then you're going to be fine. That's what I didn't do. Now how many know? That's actually what happened. All right? That's actually what happened. But I, I didn't get into it. If I would have done that to, to, my, to McKenzie, she would have looked at me and say, where's Nana? <laughs> That's what it would have been. I mean, it would have been, where's Nana? She didn't come to me. For all the explanation. She just wanted to be held. I said, baby, it'll be all right. You're good. You know, just sit here with Papa G. Just relax. You're all right. It's all going to, and then about three minutes later, she goes, okay, I'm good. Back out the place she went. Now, I say that. Sometimes we bang ourselves. And being adults, we want the whole description of like what happened, why did it happen, and what do you intend to do with what happened. And Jesus just says, 
church. Why don't you come sit on my lap? Let me hold you. You don't need to know everything. You'll be all right. Just let me hold you. And being the adults that we are, we insist that God tell us everything. And sometimes all you get from heaven is, shh. You don't need to know everything. You just need to know the one who knows everything. Relax. Chill. Stop it. And just be here with me. Now, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm the compulsive, want to know, analytical you know, one, two, three, four, five. I want to know it all. Man, I've had, I've had more than once in my life just Jesus say, can you just be quiet? I'm not going to tell you everything. I don't want you to know everything. I just want you to know me. Many times I've said, got it, good. Last thing on this point is this. God uses these tough times to draw us in closer. You see it in the Bible, Joseph. In Genesis, you see the story of Job. Okay, God doesn't let these knees get banged and everything in life to push us away. He wants to use that to pull us closer. It's just that we misinterpret all that. Well, where are you, God? Letting all this stuff bang on me, hurt me. Where are you? And God says... I did that so that you would run to me. I didn't do that so you'd run from me. You're completely misconstruing this. Please, let me help you in your hurt. Don't use your hurt to run from me. Amen? Number three, read it out loud. An enduring church grows in love for one another. And it says here, and the love all of you have for one another, notice increasing wow in this time of persecution he is saying this is not the time to be running from other people this is the time that you ought to be running to other people god uses tough times to strengthen our relationship with other followers of christ now i'm just going to talk about the elephant in the room here okay i'm just going to hit it head on everybody say go for it pastor the very thing that we need, other people, we are now being told the very thing that we need is the very thing that threatens us. And talk about being caught in the middle. You need other people. Stay away from them. Six feet. All these. And I am not here to mock any of those protocols, okay? I'm not, that's not my intent. But you have to understand the tension that, that has put us, put us in. Even though we may have a valid reason for some of the things that we are doing, that hasn't changed my nature in the fact that I still need other people. So we have to use a little creativity on how it can be done in an appropriate fashion. But I can tell you this without fail, this is not the time to crawl into your hole and submerge and disappear and then resurface in three to four months. This isn't the time. We need one another. I may have said this earlier, but again, while I was at the funeral, there were a couple superintendents there, and they're saying that their pastors are struggling. The depression. I don't think it's any different among the all just... Average, normal, every day. I don't think that's unique to the pastors. I just think that's in general society. Because we're told we need people, but yet I'm told I have to stay away from them. And so here's this. You have to be deliberate. I am by no means encouraging anybody. Listen to me. I'm not encouraging anybody to act in a reckless behavior. But you have to recognize there is another challenge for you there. You need other people you are a social being i am a social being 
Some of us may like more human contact than others, but we were all designed to have some type of human contact. Amen? And so it becomes that tension and that challenge. And let me just say, figure out a way to stay in touch with people in your circle. Yes, you may have to follow certain protocols, but I can tell you this, do not absent yourself from your sphere of friends. You need them. By the way, they need you too. Amen? That was really weak. I'm just telling you, this is a... We have a Celebrate Recovery. We, have, we know of others nationally because of the shutdown and folks who were battling addictions have not been able to meet for a season. Ours is now meeting again. That shutdown was devastating to those who had already broken their bondage and many of them have fallen back into it. In one sense, it kept them safe from the COVID. But it destroyed them in another arena of life. They weren't ready to be put in isolation. If they, if they could have done that, they would have never been going to celebrate recovery. And many of them have relapsed. Many of them are struggling. Some have lost their lives. It's a, it's, it's, it's a tension, I'm just telling you. <laughs> and I don't have all the answers. I'm just asking Jesus help us. And whoever's in the lab who's trying to come up with the vaccine, bless them. Let them get an answer. Amen? All right, number four, read it out loud. An enduring church perseveres in hope. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. Notice the word here. He's not talking, he didn't even mention deliverance. How many know that's what everybody's interested in? Don't talk to me about endurance, talk to me about deliverance. But sometimes the season communicates that deliverance is not near, and so I need to start having my deliverance. And this is really new for us as Americans because we turn on the news and we see pandemics that have hit other areas of our, our world, the Africans, and you know something started there and they shut it down and you see all these people in their suits and the UN and everybody's doing it. You see it happen sometimes in Asia and a variety of areas. And you know we watch that you know, for a minute, maybe a minute and a half, and then we move on to another story, and 30 minutes later, it's off our brain until the news decides to give us an update. And now, all of a sudden, we're four months into this. It's, not their, it's also our story. This is a new challenge for many people. They've never had anything like this last this long. And so we're as Amer when, you, when you're the most prosperous nation, not only today, but in history, you know, the idea of suffering can be different because our idea of suffering is my car broke down and I had to look for alternative transportation for two days. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got to get to my job. It's real, real inconvenient, man. It's just, you know, oh, unbelievable. And so something like this throws us all for a car ball. We're like, I've, I've never had anything in my life bad last this long. And so the Bible has a lot to say about suffering. But it just rolls off our back because when we read it, we're like, we have a different definition of what it means. So now that we have a, a new definition of suffering, now let's revisit these scriptures. This perseverance means courageous endurance of trouble. I don't even like the word endurance. I want deliverance. I want healing. Okay? But, so here we go. What are some of these, what are some of, uh, some of these scriptures that I was looking for, and it seems that I've lost them. I think we've lost a couple slides, guys. So anyway, what's that? You going to help me out? No? All right. But the Bible in James says, rejoice in your sufferings. But I don't want to rejoice, I want deliverance. But it says, rejoice. See, now all of a sudden it has a different, it has a different take. 
Rejoice in my suffering. And how long do I have to rejoice? Like, do I rejoice and then deliverance shows up? No, you get to rejoice as long as it lasts. Well, how long is that going to be? Because I want to get into phase two, which is deliverance. Well, see, that's the thing about rejoicing in your suffering. You don't know how long it's going to be. And God doesn't tell you. He just says rejoice. Well, that's not right. A church, an enduring church, perseveres in hope. Amen? Last one is this. Everybody read it. An enduring church maintains a kingdom attitude. We're going to look at a couple other scriptures that I just referenced there. But it says, all this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. So let's look at the attitude. What is the attitude? I just, I just referenced it, but it says in 1 Peter 4, 13, rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings. See, we earlier said you participate in the divine nature, right? By participating in the divine nature, you get to participate in his sufferings. I will wait for the amens to die down. I don't mind participating in the divine nature. I just didn't know that suffering was coming with the package. Yeah. Jesus suffered. When we participate in his divine nature, we get everything that he went through. So we also get a little bit of the suffering that he went through. So that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. You think, how can suffering, because when you're suffering, and you, you hold on and you don't quit, when you step into eternity, you're going to pause and look back at that suffering and go, yeah, that was worth it. Now, it's hard to say that on this side. Because all, all we know is, is what I feel and what I'm going through today. But when you go through that and one day step across into eternity, you'll look back and go, <laughs> that was peanuts. Compared to the eternity that I just was given, that I received, And then you come to James, chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Let me just pause. How many have ever asked God to bless you? Oh, that's a pathetic response. We never think. Bless me. And God says, okay, let me give you a lot of problems. Whoa, that, see, that's your Americanism. Make sense? Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Sometimes God says, I'll bless you. Here's a trial. See you in six months. If you persevere, I'll bless you. That's the story of Job. He persevered when it was so hard. And it just didn't last a short season in Job's life. It went on and on for a period of time. And God blessed him because of his perseverance. And it goes on, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. He makes that reference again. Man, you go through this. I know you think it's the end of the world and you think you deserve better and God ought to do something. But he says, I'm telling you, when you step across eternity and you look back, you're going to go, oh my, that was worth it. So let me wrap it up this way. Don't quit. Everybody say that, don't quit. Don't quit. It will be worth it. This is not the time to pull away from your faith. This is not a time to run from your faith. This is a time to run to it, embrace it. And if all you can get out of your mouth is, Jesus, help me. I've told a number of people, and they've come, folks who were nervous and full of anxiety, you know, the protocols, and just not certain. And I said, I would never ask you to do something stupid. I would never ask you to do something in violation of your conscience. But I said, you've got to realize you're, you're a human being who needs social interaction. I would encourage you, at least try to come once a month just once 
And I said, we have multiple services. So you have the ability to gravitate to a service that has an attendance that you're more comfortable with. But I said, listen, I, I just tell you, you're a human being. And if you're not careful, you'll be trading one problem for a bigger problem. We are designed to be around each other. But I am not, everybody, I didn't say throw caution to the wind. It's a tough, it's a tough thing to thread right now. It's tough. But I have to somewhere balance this between the two. I need, yes, I understand this. But I also understand this. We've got to thread the needle. And so I encourage people who are really full of fear and anxiety, and I say, put yourself in a position, too, where God can help you begin to work on the fear and anxiety. Because God may be taking you through a process to help you. But you've got to start the process somewhere, sometime. And again, follow everything that you need to be safe in those contexts. Man, please hear that. But I'm here to tell you, we're now into this. The Christians were outlawed and threatened. Don't you dare me or we'll kill you. It didn't take the Christians too long to go, I can't do this thing by myself. I'm willing to risk my life. And if the Rome, in it, Rome arrest me, Rome arrest me. Now the Christians weren't dumb but either. Here we are. You know, they very responsibly because they understood if you arrest me that they take my family so i need to be smart and wise in how i execute what i'm about to do with my life i need to be smart because it's not just my life they'll kill my family but even the christians in persecution said can't do this by myself i need other people i can't survive and all I can say is this, I'm trying to be informative to help you to make healthy and wise decisions. I am not standing here say, you do it my way. And everybody said, thank you, pastor. Okay. I want, listen, this is a great time to thrive in a different kind of way that we've never been accustomed to. And everybody said, amen. Come on, let's everybody stand. Would you do that? And all over this house of God, would you just lift your hands? And I want you for the next 30 to 40 seconds, I want you to praise Him today. Praise Him for His faithfulness. Man, you're here. Look, we're, we're, we're still here. Praise Him for that, man. Praise Him for His faithfulness and helping and guiding and directing. Come on, everybody, lift your voices now for about 30 to 45 seconds.
ask us to do before we dismiss. Can you just lift your hands? And I want you to point them out towards the walls, north, south, east, west. And I want you to prophesy. These mountains are going to start coming down. These walls that have been holding back the, the, the movement that God wants in this nation are going to fall. Come on, everybody. Lift your hands. And I want you to prophesy. God, take down those mountains. Take down these walls. Take down these things. Defeat this virus in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody. Lift your voice. Come on, sing it now.